What's going on everybody and welcome back to another video. Today, we're bringing up something very, very interesting and very special. Today, we're gonna be tackling an old ale. And what exactly is an old ale? So first of all, it's a challenge beer style that was given to me by Trent at the Brew Show uh, to use as part of the base for a Groff style ale. However, uh, what we're doing today is the actual full-on old ale brew itself. It's a beer style that I definitely wouldn't associate with summer. In fact, it's pretty much the base for every winter warmer ever. I think it's something that's uh, relatively forgotten uh, in the grand scheme of things. You don't go to bars and find old ales. You just don't. It just sounds like it's a beer that's been kept away in a cellar somewhere and left to oxidize and age. And well, that's not exactly wrong, but it's also not exactly true. It's actually got quite a wide variety of color and alcohol strength overall, uh, but it's generally a very malty, relatively dark, relatively strong beer. It's like something that falls in between an English barley wine and uh, say like an amber ale, really. The one characteristic thing that you're gonna find in most old ale recipes is some form of dark sugar though. Either brown sugar, molasses, or what we're using today, dark treacle, black treacle. Uh, these ales are gonna be full of flavor, full of booze, and most importantly, they're gonna hold up very, very well to extended aging. They probably will be completely drinkable right off the bat, but extended aging will certainly do them some good. This is probably not gonna to be too difficult of a brew day, but it will be important to make sure that we take care of our fermentation, and we'll get more into the fermentation notes here in a bit. I do want to thank Northern Brewer for sending me all the ingredients I needed for the batch of beers, so be sure to check them out if you're shopping for ingredients for this batch. And also Claw Hammer Supply, because they are the ones that manufacture the system I'll be brewing on today, which is the 20 gallon, 240 volt system. I'm gonna be using the 20 gallon system today because not only is this a really pretty large grain bill overall, but I'm also brewing eight gallons of this. That's right, eight gallons. When Trent challenged me to uh, do this old ale and uh, use it as a base for the Groff, I only needed about three gallons of wort for that, which is, that's small potatoes from my regular system. However, I really did wanna get a full five gallons of beer out of this one though. So I'm actually targeting eight gallons post boil. That gives me five gallons for my own traditional old ale fermentation and three gallons to blend with apple juice in the wort for a graf. Uh, but we'll talk about that in a separate video. But for now, this recipe is for eight gallons. If you wanna scale it down to five gallons or scale it up to 10 gallons, you should be perfectly able to do so by entering it into some basic brewing software. Everything I'm talking about here is in relation to brewing eight gallons of it. So for the grist on this one, we're gonna be using 20 pounds of Simpson's Maris Otter, which is gonna constitute the base uh, malt here. The Maris Otter is a lovely biscuity, bready base malt. We're gonna add some uh, complexity to that with a pound of Simpson's Light Crystal Malt. That's about a 30 Lava Bond Crystal Malt. It's not Crystal 10 by any means. That is also an English Crystal Malt, which is gonna add more complexity than your basic Crystal Malts. And I do stress that uh, that is a big difference to be made. And they are very, very traditional in English brewing especially when you're making old ales like this one. On top of that, we're adding another half a pound of Simpson's Extra Dark Crystal Malt. And Extra Dark Crystal Malt is really extra dark. It's like, I think it's like 180 Lava Bond. I'm only adding half a pound of that to the whole thing to get some dark roasted notes, uh, some burned caramel notes, and some uh, hopefully dark fruit out of that as well. So we're also gonna add half a pound of pale chocolate malt from Thomas Fawcett. Um, this is gonna add some color and some roastiness, of course. Uh, but what it's actually gonna be doing is more important than just that. It's actually gonna be adding some balance. It's gonna help kind of add a bit of a drying character to the beer, and that's gonna help balance out the excessive sweetness that we might get from using our next ingredient, which is two pounds of Lyle's Black Treacle. So this is the sugar addition that's so characteristic of Old Ales. Black Treacle is similar to molasses, except it has the consistency of tar. It's a sugar processing byproduct that has really, really intense dark burned sugar character. Very similar to blackstrap molasses, in fact. That being said, we're gonna get loads of really, really rich and complex sugar-based flavors out of that. Um, and I'm really excited to see what that adds to the beer. That whole grain bill should get us somewhere around an OG of 1075 for eight gallons of wort. 
The hops on this one, it's really very simple. It's just simple bittering uh, just to balance things out. And we're gonna be using Nugget for this one, um, which uh, is a traditional hop for like barley wines and stuff like that. Um, so I'm adding in uh, about one and three quarter ounces of Nugget to this. Uh, it's gonna be 16.3% alpha acid, which means that it's uh, pretty potent. So adding in one and three quarter ounces is gonna get me 50 IBUs when I add it at 60 minutes. And that's all we're adding to the entire thing as far as hops go. For the water on this, we're gonna be using a water profile that seems counterintuitive when you're brewing a big, strong malty beer. So normally you would think malty beer, okay, should probably push the chlorides, not sulfates. I'm actually turning that around on its head because I am so afraid of sickly sweet finishing gravity on this one. I do not want this to be um, a cloyingly sweet finish on the beer. I want it to be balanced and drinkable. And so I'm actually gonna be trying to balance all that out with the water profile itself. And I'm gonna be doing a two to one sulfate to chloride ratio, which promotes slight bitterness, but it also uh, kind of makes the finish of the beer a bit drier. It helps make some flavors pop, and it's also a more traditional English profile. So the water profile I'm going for is 60 parts per million of calcium, eight parts per million of magnesium, 16 parts per million of sodium, 64 parts per million of chloride, 122 parts per million of sulfate and zero parts per million of bicarbonate. And in order to get that water profile, I'm gonna be adding eight grams of gypsum, four grams of epsom, two grams of sodium chloride, and four grams of calcium chloride, all to the mash water. For the yeast in this beer, we're gonna be using a tried and true absolute classic Lalamand Nottingham Ale Yeast. I'm choosing Nottingham in this case over something like Windsor or London or any other typical classic British strain because of its ability to ferment maltotriose. That's a complex sugar which is going to really raise the final gravity of the beer if we don't ferment it. It's gonna contribute to that cloying sweet characteristic that we want to avoid. So Nottingham, we'll ferment that, we'll turn it to alcohol, so we'll get a higher alcohol content and a lower final gravity, which should be more balanced overall. And last but certainly not least, the last variable I have to tweak here is the mash. And I'm gonna be doing a long single infusion mash at 152 Fahrenheit, straight up balanced middle of the road for about 90 minutes just due to the volume and due to the high gravity of this entire grist. I'm really excited to get this going. Um, from what I've heard, Treacle really adds a tremendous flavor to the beer, so I can't wait to see what happens with that. And uh, yeah, let's go ahead and get brewing. I started out by adding about 13 gallons of spring water to my 20 gallon 240 volt claw hammer supply brewing system and I heated that up to the mash temperature of 152. While it was heating up I measured out all of my grain and milled it and also measured out my water salts and added those into the strike water as it heated up. Once I reached the target mash temperature of 152, I went ahead and I dowed in with my entire grain bell with the exception of the black treacle. I stirred it up thoroughly and broke up any grain clumps and let it sit and recirculate for about 10 minutes before pulling a sample for a pH measurement. I found my pH measurement to be just about on target at about 5.2 and decided not to add anything into uh, the whole thing to adjust for pH. I let the mash sit at 152 Fahrenheit for about 90 minutes total, just a long mash rest because there was so much volume involved and a lot of liquid, it's very thin liquor to grist ratio. Once that 90 minutes was up, I raised it up to 170 Fahrenheit for a mash out rest, let it stay there for about 15 minutes, then pulled out the grain basket and let that drain for about another 15 minutes. At this point, I heated the entire thing up to a temperature slightly below boiling, just to get a jump start on things and to prevent a boil over. Once the basket was finished draining, then I continued on to a full boil. At the uh, 60 minute mark of the boil, I added my 50 IBUs worth of nugget, and that ended up being about 1.75 ounces of nugget. I also added my two pounds of black treacle at this time. I really should have thought about this more and heated up the black treacle prior to actually adding it in because it is a tar-like 
sticky, syrupy mess. And when it goes into the kettle, it just takes forever to come out of the container. And I actually ended up having to uh, immerse the container in the boiling wort for a little bit to get the rest of it out after I had gotten the majority out in the first place. It was an absolute mess, but I eventually got it all in and it went in at that 60 minute mark just to reiterate. I did nothing else for the remainder of the boil with the exception of 10 minutes from the end where I added a Whirlflock tablet and some yeast nutrient. As soon as I got the entire thing chilled down to my pitching temperature, I measured my OG, found it to be exactly on target at 1075. And then I transferred three gallons of the wort over into one fermenter. I blended this with three gallons of apple juice for my graph. And then the remaining five gallons I transferred over into another anvil bucket fermenter and pitched two packets of Lalaman Nottingham Ale yeast into it and left it to ferment. All right, so now let's talk about the fermentation on this beer. Because it's a high gravity beer, we do want to pay special attention to the fermentation because this is really where things get complicated and this is where the most things can go wrong. Because of that high OG, even with a dry yeast, I would feel far more comfortable pitching multiple packets of Nottingham. So I'm gonna go ahead and pitch two packets of Nottingham into this. That's gonna give me more than enough yeast to get the job done. There's a lot of sugar to ferment here and the yeast are gonna go absolutely nuts at the beginning of the fermentation. So not only are we pitching a healthy large amount of yeast, but we're also gonna be pitching them at a very cold temperature, 62 Fahrenheit. The combination of a high pitch rate and a low pitch temperature is really gonna help reduce the risk of fusel alcohols and sharp, strong, uh, harsh alcoholic notes that can result from not following those rules. And also it can be uh, also exacerbated by having that high sugar content in the wort uh, just from simple sugars as well. So yeast tend to kind of do funny things when there's a lot of simple sugars in the wort. So you want to make sure you're taking care of them. As the fermentation kicks off and gets started, I'm going to hold it at 62 Fahrenheit, which is low even for Nottingham, um, for a couple days. At this point, most of the risk of the pitching related off flavors, fusel alcohols, etc., will be uh, pretty much diminished after like three days of fermentation. So at that point, it'll start to ramp things up slowly. And we'll probably want to finish this one up at about 68 Fahrenheit. And it's probably gonna take about two weeks to get through the whole fermentation. But that being said, Nottingham is a pretty efficient yeast and it, got, it does tend to go pretty quickly. So it might be faster. At 1075, this isn't a ridiculously high gravity beer. It's up there, but it's not crazy. So it's not gonna require a ton of aging to really hit its prime. It will benefit from long-term extended aging, and if you want to bottle this and leave it in your cellar for a couple months, it'll probably taste really, really good way down the road, but it's not gonna be like a barley wine where you have to let it sit for six to 12 months. I'm expecting that this beer will be ready in a few weeks, and um, I'm probably gonna bottle a bunch of it, leave it at the basement, and let it sit probably until like fall to really get the best out of the aging process. But uh, that's really my plan overall in a nutshell. Now you can use a traditional English ale strain in this one, like London Ale 3 or uh, like Windsor, or ESB, one of those things. Um, and you'll probably have pretty decent results with it, but do keep in mind that it is not gonna ferment that maltotriose. And that means that you're not going to see as low of a final gravity as if you had used something like Nottingham. So um, do keep that in mind. You can also brew these though with a standard American ale yeast if you want to. Uh, like USO5 would be a great candidate uh, to ferment this one with because it's clean and it's a rather well attenuated yeast. So that would actually be a pretty good alternative if you don't want to use the classic British style yeast. Theoretically, one could also use a Kvike strain. Um, probably a good candidate here would be Lutra or Oslo, something clean. My thoughts are you don't want to add too many uh, additional esters to things uh, that don't go well with the flavor. Uh, so things like Voss, Hornendal, those particular strains may not really be a great idea. One could also pressure ferment this if you wanted to. Pressure fermentation will help reduce that risk of fusel alcohols, like I mentioned before, um, and excessive esters that can result from under pitching or from fermenting this one too hot. If you don't have the capacity to ferment at 62 Fahrenheit, like you might be looking into other options. So pressure fermentation is an option. It will reduce the ester activity. It will reduce the complexity that you get from your yeast contribution. So do keep that in mind, but 
it's a perfectly reasonable thing to do that for this type of beer. The main thing here, no matter the yeast, no matter the method, is just make sure you're taking care of your fermentation. It might want a little bit extra yeast nutrient if you have some on standby. It's not a bad idea to add that in just to help them go along. And also adding in enough oxygen at the beginning of fermentation is very important as well for these high gravity beers. The yeast absolutely need that oxygen to reproduce quickly and establish a healthy start to that fermentation. Even up to 1075, you can probably get adequate oxygenation by splashing or shaking, although you're gonna get far better results by direct oxygen injection. Uh, so that's what I do. I do recommend adding in pure oxygen if you have the ability to do so. The kits are not expensive and the uh, little oxygen tanks, you can pick them up at the Ace Hardware store. They're not too expensive either. So anyway, I'm very excited to see how this goes. Uh, it's gonna be an interesting fermentation, a very interesting beer, and I'll catch you guys in a few weeks when it's all ready. So until then, cheers. So fermentation for the old ale actually went very fast, all things considered. I did not honestly expect it to go as fast as it did. It went from 1075 down to 1011 in just over a week, actually. Um, and although it was actually at its final gravity, I did let it rest and condition on the yeast for another week or two before packaging. Once I had it packaged, I force carbonated to about two and a half volumes of CO2 and let it sit on tap and lager for another couple weeks before actually trying it. And I'm glad I did because when it was a little bit young, it had a relatively harsh characteristic that faded once it was able to lager for another two weeks or so. This beer is called This Old Ale, and it comes in at 8.5% ABV and a total of 50 IBUs. For the appearance of the beer, initially it looks murky, but it's actually only slightly hazy. There's a really nice red color that's actually shining through when the light hits it just at the right angle, and uh, otherwise it looks brown. But it is actually a pretty looking beer. It has a nice tan head with good structure. Doesn't stick around forever, but leaves a good layer and a circle on the glass. From the correct angle, the appearance of this beer is actually stunning, uh, but it's very hard to get on camera as you have to have both the right kind of glass and the right angle and the right light. But the bottom line is it's slightly hazy, has a nice red undertone and uh, a good looking tan head on it. All right, so now let's go in for aroma. I'm getting a lot of a rich malty character, a deep richness, um, semi-sweet kind of character though. Definitely heavy on things like toasted caramel and, and like um, kind of toasted marshmallow character. Get a little bit of like a leather note too maybe. Um, and then definitely a contribution of some sort of dried like dark fruit, like a fig or a plum. It's got a very strong uh, aroma to it, actually quite surprising, uh, at least for me. Um, so that's actually really nice to see. So now let's go in for mouthfeel. The mouthfeel in this one really isn't too uh, spectacular or interesting in general. It's just kind of like a generic medium bodied beer here. It's not very thick, it's not very full. You know, that I think that would be inappropriate for the style, but it's also not thin either. It's very drinkable uh, for what it is. The mouthfeel really does line up, I think, with that expected eight and a half percent ABV kind of mouthfeel. No real hard edges, no creaminess, no astringency. It's really not all that much to discuss about it, to be honest. Just kind of like a basic medium bodied English beer's mouthfeel. Um, that being said, easy to drink, relatively standard level of carbonation on this guy. So without further ado though, let's go in for flavor. Mm. So I've never actually had an old ale until I brewed this and then I went to HomebrewCon a few weeks ago and I had a few actual examples of old ale there. I never really had explored the style very much and um, it's a really, really interesting and very complex flavor. So as a strong British ale, it's definitely different than a wee heavy. It's definitely different than other strong Belgian ales or um, like, you know, stouts and stuff like that. It's got a little bit of a different character to it that, um, that makes it, it's really uh, its own unique thing. It's a complex flavor. And even at the BUG ratio I used, it still feels pretty bitter. Not excessively so, but the bitterness is the first thing you notice. It's a very pungent, earthy hop uh, bite to the very beginning of it. And then after that, that subsides quickly. And then we're left with a really interesting and very complex palette of malt flavors and sugar contributions. Um, so that treacle fermented out a lot. And the leftover flavor uh, that it leaves behind is nothing like the molasses or toasted uh, kind of character. It's more of like a, a strong, 
um, almost harsh sugar burned caramel kind of character. It's not to the degree that I would actually go out of my way to call it harsh, um, but it definitely has some burned edges to it. And uh, it's very similar to like a toasted marshmallow character when you leave the marshmallow on the fire for a little too long and it gets pretty black and toasted. So you really get a very interesting burned caramel kind of character. Um, but it's not scorched, it's not ashy, it's not uh, in any way astringent like that. It's just got a different character to it than most other uh, sugar-based high ABV beers uh, tend to have. Um, it's a really rich malty bready base to it as well. There's a lot of toffee. And there's also a chocolate contribution to this as well. Um, really a lot of uh, very interesting stuff going on here. Actually, it leaves a really interesting lingering aftertaste of um, milk chocolate and coffee, <laughs> of all things. But um, yeah, really interesting there. Uh, the malt character is very complex, very diverse, very interesting. And as this warms up, a lot more of it is gonna come out. There's also a lot of yeast related um, character in this and I was kind of trying to avoid that um, by selecting Nottingham and by giving it a really high pitch rate. I was really hoping that I was gonna cut down on the amount of yeast character coming out of this. But unfortunately, this has got a lot of apple in it. Maybe the fermentation temperature was still somewhat too high. Um, I guess I'm gonna have to dial that back next time I brew one of these or perhaps just let this one age out a little bit longer over time. Over the last few weeks, this has conditioned and started to mature a little bit. And it's really nice because it used to be very harsh, very strong with the alcohol notes at the very beginning, um, as is standard with high ABV beers. However, at this point though, it's starting to hit that home stretch where it's smoothed out. It's really quite balanced. Um, and that harshness, that alcohol note has faded away completely. Uh, so, you know, the, the only reminiscence of that is the apple tinge that you're gonna get on this. Um, and that's about it. The other examples I tried at HomebrewCon included an award-winning version that was brewed by the, um, the president of the California Homebrewers Association. And these tasted very, very similar. I got a lot of the same kind of burned caramel characteristic, the same bitterness level, um, and the same kind of esteriness, I guess, with the apple note being in there. And that did two things for me. It, number one, really solidified that I had done the right thing here, because I wasn't quite sure when I first tasted this. And two, also solidified the fact that I'm not a huge fan of old ales. Of the other strong types of beer that exist out there, especially strong British ales, this is not my favorite. Um, I would go for a wee heavy over this any day of the week. That being said, it made for a very interesting experiment and a very uh, interesting beer. I honestly don't think I would have gone out of my way really to brew this beer if I wasn't challenged by the Wheel of Fortune that Trent put together for the Graph video. So it's an interesting selection. It's an interesting beer. I don't know if I would ever really make this a second time. That being said, this is only about a month old at this point. So maybe if I give it some more time to age, maybe a little bit of micro oxidation in there might actually help bring out some more interesting flavors. So what I am gonna do is instead of finishing off the rest of this keg, I'm actually gonna package a whole bunch of it away and age it in my basement for another couple months, maybe six to eight months more, and we'll see what happens to that flavor over time. This is called Old Ale for a reason. It stands up well to aging, so there's no reason why I shouldn't try that. And um, it'll be interesting to see what comes of this in the future. When it comes to potential improvements, I'm not quite sure because from my understanding, the style has to be bitter and it has to have the strong dark uh, roasted caramel notes in it. Not my favorite flavors of all time. So, I mean, honestly, if I'm tailoring this to my own personal tastes, I would have made this sweeter and I would have uh, cut down the bittering addition a bit, maybe modified the water profile to have a little bit less uh, sulfate in it. But um, I don't think you're supposed to do that if you're trying to brew Old Ale. So, um, I'm just gonna kinda let you guys figure the uh, potential improvements out for yourselves if you wanna brew this style. So that's gonna do it for us today, guys. If you enjoyed the video, please go ahead, hit the like button before you leave, and also subscribe if you haven't already. It means a lot to me, helps my videos get a little bit more exposure to the rest of YouTube, and I do appreciate it. Comment down below as well if you have any thoughts on the whole uh, experiment, if you notice anything, maybe you're an avid old ale brewer, and um, you've got some ideas and advice for me, let me know down in the comments, I would appreciate them. So if you wanna support the channel, please consider picking up a t-shirt like this one, there's many other designs like it, um, and also not like it, in the description box. 
uh, merch store. So please check the store out. Uh, it's a great way to help support me and you get something out of it as well. I also have a Patreon. My Patreon supporters have helped make a massive difference and change the production quality in the channel over the last couple years. I think you guys have noticed that. So a big thank you to them for helping make that possible. So if you head over there, you'll get to see my videos early and uh, have a couple other perks. So please check it out if you're curious. I also have the super thanks button and there's the uh, channel membership option. Both of those things help me out quite a bit as well, if those are more of your thing. I also have an Amazon store down in the description box where you can find all the brewing equipment that I recommend and use on the regular, as well as uh, everything that helps make this channel possible and makes it function. So check it all out if you're curious about that stuff. And finally, you can find me on Instagram and Facebook as The Apartment Brewer. So check those links out for some more frequent content updates between videos. I try to keep that active as much as I can. And if you're still here, thank you very much for watching all the way to the end of the video. It means a lot to me that you are still here. These can get kind of long and with beers that aren't hazy IPAs, they're not as sensational, like a lot of people don't really want to watch all the way to the end. So I appreciate it if you're still here. It means a lot to me. And uh, so therefore, this goes out to you guys. So until next one, cheers.